Animating four-legged creatures can be a daunting task. They have twice the amount of legs than us, so therefore there's twice the amount of things to keep track of. But what if I told you there's a simple way of approaching them? Hi, I'm Skitty, and today we're gonna go over everything you need to know to get animating quadrupeds. Looking through nature, there are countless different quadruped creatures, all with their own unique bone and muscle structure, changing how each one walks. A horse will walk entirely different from a dog or a lion, but there will also be generalized groups, so the lion will have similarities to the house cat. This is why studying reference for the creature you're animating is so important. Now you may be asking, what about creatures that don't exist in real life? We can't possibly have reference for those. And while that may be true, real life reference is still our most useful resource. This is why when we see animation of a T-Rex, they look puppy-like with a hint of a chicken. They are just poultry puppies after all. Quadrupeds do all have a similar base for their walk cycle, so for the sake of learning, we're gonna create a generic quadruped cycle, and then we're going to apply it to a few different creatures to see the differences. Ignoring the fact that the front legs are offset from the back legs for now, we can split this up to view it as two bipeds walking joined together. The front legs are just behind the back legs by about four frames. We even get to take the 16 frame cycle structure that bipeds are animated with and make any necessary adjustments later when the generic cycle is done. This is why I strongly recommend understanding biped walk cycles before attempting a quad. If you don't yet have a basic understanding of walk cycles for a biped, I'll leave a link in the description down below so you can check out the tutorial I made on those. The workflow structure that I follow for quadrupeds is creating the starting and ending pose, which is the contact pose for the front foot, then animating the front legs without worrying about anything else, then focusing on the back legs, adding any necessary offset, then finally secondary objects like flappy ears or tails. Let me know in the comments below if you've used a workflow different from this one. The reason I start with the front legs, even though the quadruped center of gravity is more so at the back hips, is because the front legs are typically more flexible, allowing for bigger motions. Just like with a biped character, a quadruped has two main poses, the contact position and the passing position. Cutting out all other information, these two poses by themselves should be able to read as a walk cycle. Let's analyze the contact. While the front legs are at their contact, the back legs are in their passing position, pushing the pelvis up. The chest is down, therefore the head is as well. The shoulder is down, which gets pushed up when the weight is transferred on the down position. Depending on the animal, the head will either rotate with or against the front foot. Let's rotate against the front foot so that the head is in a general looking forward direction, kind of like a big cat. The root of the tail moves with the back legs. Think of it like animals have to wiggle their butts in order to propel their back legs forward. The rest of the tail would be a secondary object, so we're gonna leave that for later. Hi, Leia. Once your contact position is done, copy it to your ending pose and then mirror it on frame 17 for your other foot's contact. In case you haven't seen my previous video on walk cycles, we need to create the key on frame 17 for a 16 frame walk cycle because we're eventually going to have to delete our ending position to create a seamless loop for the cycle, otherwise the last frame would play twice, creating a hitch. At this point, set all of your existing tangents to linear so that we don't get any strange easing on the loop. Now let's look at our passing position, which will happen on frame 9. The back legs are now in their contact position, pushing the pelvis down. The chest is up, which in turn brings the head up. When we get to the offset phase, the head will be delayed from the chest about two to four frames to feel more like its movement is being driven. Since the front legs are passing, the shoulder will be up on the side taking the weight. Since four legs essentially gives us two sets of rotating hips to work with, the spine will end up twisting in C curves throughout the walk, constantly flipping from a C to a reverse C and back again. The up position and down position are basically our in-betweens for the cycle. The feet are changing position but the body is just complementing other poses. The difference is, they're called up and down, so we need to pull both sets of hips up or down for each pose. The up position will land on frame 5, and the down position will land on frame 13. Now we can go back and offset the head from the chest about two to four frames to get that driven feel. Next it's time for the secondary animation, which in this case is the tail. As with all secondary, we animate this last and straightforward. Whichever way the back hips are moving, the tail doesn't want to go until it has no other choice. Treat it like a whip or a piece of seaweed. Now we have a generic cycle. Congratulations! It feels like a little bit of everything and also nothing at the same time. So let's figure out how to take this generic cycle and make it into something usable on the two most commonly animated creatures, cats and dogs. 
So obviously I couldn't just copy from the generic cycle onto this one. It's a completely different rig. So I had to kind of look at it and recreate it the best that I could. And this is what I came up with. As you can see, it is a functioning cycle, but it doesn't necessarily look like a dog. And the biggest reason for this is because it's way too exaggerated. The movement of your typical dog is going to be pretty stiff, especially in their torso. The thing that stood out to me the most right off the bat is the stride length. A dog of this stature is going to have a more proud walk than this, which means taking smaller, more deliberate steps. Not only was his stride too long, but his feet were also raising too much. We're already looking much better. The next thing that stood out to me was how big of a bounce he had. It's always great to start from an exaggerated place and then tone it down, as it's much easier to reduce than it is to add. So all we have to do here is take that bounce and just scale it in the graph editor. There was also some rotate Z on the spine controls to help with that up and down, and it was also very exaggerated for a dog. So even though the bounce itself is looking better, we still need to tone down everything else to match it. If at any time you're struggling to get a pose right, remember you can always go back to your reference to analyze it. Animal joints behave differently than ours, so it may help to draw over them to really see how they work. As stiff as dog torsos typically are, their hip joints are still pretty flexible, so even though there's a minimal sway in the torso, make sure you still give them a little butt wiggle so that the hips are actually propelling the back legs forward. And don't forget to just have fun while you're doing this. There's no rule that you have to get everything perfect on the first try. You can exaggerate a control just to see what it looks like and come back to it later if it's not working. Or you might need to go back and forth to tone down a little bit of one control, then a little bit of another, and back again to get it to where you think it needs to be. At this point, I decided that the amount the dog was raising his feet was still too much, so I came back and toned it down again. Never be afraid of changing your animation. You've already done it once, so there's nothing stopping you from being able to recreate it again. Next was fixing the pose of the tail. The animation all works fine, but unless a dog has a negative emotion, like fear or sadness, he's not going to hold his tail so close to his body. So by shifting the curves in the graph editor, we can pull the tail up while maintaining all of the animation. Much better. We're looking much closer to a dog now, and there's not much left to get through. Now we can skip ahead and do some secondary that we missed before, which is his ears. His ears don't have to be animated beautifully because it's more of a complementary action than a focus action, so I have a pretty simple workflow that I use every time. I start with two poses. When the dog is in his highest position, I pose the ears down, and when the dog is in his lowest position, I pose the ears up. Then I offset the controls from each other so that the base of the ears stay on the frame that we had them on, the control up from that will be one frame delayed, the next control one delayed from that, and so on and so forth. Then all that's left is grab all of the controls, loop it, and drag it around the timeline until it feels right with your animation. Now that our cycle is essentially done, the last thing I'm doing is going through and addressing any crashing that exists. For the dog, the only thing that I seem to have to address this time is his shoulders. And with that, our doggo is done-o. He looks much more like a dog than the generic base cycle did. So let's go back to that generic base cycle and see how that would work on a house cat. Not gonna lie, it was pretty jarring going from a finished dog cycle to, well, this. But this is how the generic cycle translated onto the cat model. Because remember, this isn't a copy, it's just a recreation. It definitely doesn't look good, but it looks better than the dog did when we first started. Some elements of the generic cycle were too exaggerated for the cat, but some were also not exaggerated enough. Cats are a lot more flexible than dogs. The general rule being, if a cat can fit its head under somewhere, the rest of their body can too. So with that in mind, we don't have to tone down the twist of the spine the way that we had to for the dog. The generic was exaggerated on purpose, so we will a little bit, just on a much smaller scale. If you remember back to my tutorial on bi head walk cycles, there was a difference in how men and women walk. The men had very little hip sway, which made them have a bigger up and down motion, while the female had a more exaggerated hip sway, keeping the up and down of the cycle minimal and more graceful. The same can be said about the difference between cats and dogs. The dogs have a more stiff cycle, so they're going to bounce up and down more than a cat would. The flexibility of the cat's spine is weaving in and out, which will move the cat from side to side, but not nearly as much up and down. The next thing I'm adjusting is the flexibility of the cat's wrists. The back legs will be more akin to the dog or a bunny, where the wrist moves, but it's very minimal. The cat's front legs, on the other hand, are very, very flexible. So we need to show this with how much the foot slaps back and bends forward on the stride. We also need to watch how much we're making them lift their feet off the ground during the walk. 
Remember, animals need to conserve their energy in case trouble arises. The more they lift their feet, the more work it is for them. Next on the list is working on how much head bob is in the cycle. Cats are natural born predators, and because of this, they're very sneaky and silent walkers. With how much twist we have in the cat's spine, the head can stay relatively still, focusing on their prey. Next, we get to reposition the tail pose, just like we did with the dog. Just like dogs, cats are big fans of showing you their butts, especially when they're happy. The only time their tail will be down is with a negative emotion. The end is in sight now, so we can go ahead and put the secondary animation on the ears just like we did with the dog cycle, offsetting each control from each other and then shifting them around on the timeline until it feels right. Once the rest was fleshed out, I decided that the torso was still swaying a little too much, so I went back in and toned it down a bit. There is one thing that I tweaked off camera after this was finished because I wasn't quite happy with it, which wasn't the twist of the torso, but the sway of the cat actually moving from side to side. This isn't something that the dog felt like it needed where their torso is so stiff, but with how much the cat was swaying, it felt like it needed some actual translation. And here is the finished catwalk. Let me know in the comments below which cycle you think turned out better. I'm leaning towards the cat, but I'm pretty undecided, so let me know what you think. And that's all I'm gonna say about quadruped walk cycles. Do you think you could do one for yourself yet? Leave a comment below if there's something you didn't understand. Like and subscribe if you learned something. Links to socials are in the description, and remember to always use a reference.